Welcome to 50 Words for Murder, where we delve into the stories behind the headlines. I am your host, Justin, and today I have a very special guest with me, Dan Catullo, um, who is a director, a producer. I actually met him um, this past weekend dealing with Riley Strain down in Nashville, and I'll let him introduce himself a little bit more, and we're going to be talking about uh, Riley today and fraternities and just a whole bunch of stuff. It's going to be a really interesting episode. Welcome, Dan. Thanks, Justin. So, um, you know, like you said, I'm a, I'm a filmmaker. I'm, I live in, a, in Southern California. Um, I predominantly do music stuff. Like I'm most known for some of my big music specials, like everything from the Foo Fighters at the Acropolis and Dave Matthews Central Park and Alicia Keys and uh, Russian Rio, all, all that stuff. But I also do a lot of documentaries and I do a lot of serious documentaries. Um, you know, it's my documentary career started back in 2013 with a film called The Square that I was an executive producer on that we were fortunate enough to get an Academy Award nomination and win Sundance and won a few Emmys and it went on from there. But the past eight years, I've been really entrenched in uh, the world of Hazen, shockingly. That's what brought me to Nashville um, because I was I was already there. I was going there on business anyway because we were opening up an office there for my company. But um, I wanted to peek into the Riley case because um, I've been doing a docu-series on Hazen. And I also did a short film about a boy who died at, at, at Delta Chi at VCU. So Delta Chi is already on my radar and I've already been looking into them. And when I heard what happened to Riley, um, you know, I wanted to go there and really kind of just peek around and see what we could find out about it. Okay. And so w regarding Riley, let's, in case you somehow were under a rock and you missed that whole thing that was going on. Uh, Riley Strain was a 22 year old uh, student from Mizzou, from the University of Missouri. He had come down to Nashville for spring formal um, and then was removed or kicked out, escorted out, however you want to put it, from Luke Bryant's bar off Broadway. And then all of a sudden he was missing. There was various surveillance footage that showed him uh, walking up the street, running into a pole, and then all of a sudden he seemed seemingly vanished into thin air. Um, a lot of social media got involved with the case, trying to help find him, which ultimately he was found by a barge worker or dock worker, uh, you know, between a barge under some debris. Uh, so it wasn't a very happy ending, and it was really quite tragic. And one of the things, and one of the reasons I wanted Dan to come on today is because we were talking, and then he said something that I had not realized. Now, while people this past week, um, when all of this happened, were talking about the fraternity lawyering up and the brothers, and you know, I kind of would come on and say, look, fraternities at this level, they get lawyers. They're there to protect the fraternity. They're there to protect the name. But what Dan brought up was, why weren't any of the brothers there searching? And it made me stop and think, and that is one of the reasons why I wanted him to come on this and have a conversation because I think that there is, I was in a fraternity, Dan was in a fraternity. I think that there is a bigger issue at play that needs more awareness around it. And I think that for the sake of Riley, we need to, to have this conversation uh, as well regarding Delta Chi and regarding fraternities because it's supposed to be a brotherhood, right, Dan? Correct. And uh, I mean, go to Delta Chi's website. They promote that. Uh, you know, um, and it's also like the police. I don't. I think the police even took their foot off the pedal a little bit on this because it was fraternity related. Um, in general, when there's any kind of nefarious activity or if someone was in a fraternity, um, the police tend to chalk it off as boys being boys, or they don't really look at things that could be a crime right in their face. So, again, like on the on the Riley thing, you know, I, I told you this and other people. Like, it's you know, it looks that the fraternity, it looks like the fraternity probably had nothing to do with what happened by that bridge. Um, but what I found really strange was, you know, I don't, did you go to Luke Bryan's? Were you at the bar? Did you go I didn't bar? go inside, but I, I did go inside, but I've been there in the past. I know it's, it's massive. It's like 30,000 square feet, what, three, well, four but, levels. But there's only three exits. There's the main one and the one on each side. And um, yeah. We, we went through it extensively and we went through every staircase and my understanding is the boys were on the roof and the roof had a very clear view of the front. And so even the, the back entrance is kind of on the side from what I saw. And no matter how they escorted them out, like, I don't think the bar, the bars are very, it's a, it, it's a very well run machine and they have probably 300. I've never seen more cameras in my life. So 
I'm sure they're going to be exonerated. So, because you know they they claim they only gave him one drink, but of course if they throw someone out, they're not going to take his friends through the back office, and they would they're not going to parade someone through the middle of a bar. So, but even if they put him outside, it should have taken his friends minutes, if that, to catch up with him. I mean, he he could not have gone that far and that that fast. But you know, even if let's say some freak thing, his friends lost him. Um, what I just don't understand is when, when they realized he was missing, whether it was that night or the next morning, I do find it a little weird that they waited 12 hours to call the cops. But when they finally realized he's missing, why were they not really out there in force? And they may have been, but why are they not out there talking about that? It, it feels like there was just this, this code of silence that hit right away where we heard nothing from them. I had one person message me, oh, the Delta Chi brothers were posting a lot. Well, I didn't see any of it. The only thing I saw, I saw one post on the Delta Chi social media page or Instagram page with a GoFundMe. But you would have thought Delta Chi with this wide network of brothers, you know, active active members plus alumni. You were talking about well over 100,000 people. Why were they not as a group, A, blowing up social media to try to find them? But more importantly, because you were there, I was there no one from Delta Chi was searching for him. I mean, there were lots of no. TikTokers and then the Cajun Navy. In fact, I went down to the site where they found his credit card four times in three days. I didn't see a police officer there once, which was crazy to me. Not only did I didn't see the police, but I just would have thought that if anything, remember the Cajun, the Cajun Navy set up a pop-up tent, they had a little base camp. I mm -hmm. would have thought Delta Chi would have had a base camp put together. Why weren't they there? Because it's not like the police said, stay out of it, we got this. The police weren't really doing anything because they didn't know what they were dealing with. They don't know if he ran away. I mean, even when they found his credit card, it was obvious something was going on. But they really, it still wasn't a crime in their eyes, I don't think. It was it was a missing person case. So you would think that the fraternity brothers of all people would be the ones to be searching. I mean, what the hell were we doing there? And the fraternity wasn't there. Yeah, I, in my understanding is that where there were 200 people that came down for this formal yeah. too. So they had 200 Delta Chi's plus probably dates, probably some family members that lived near here. There are, we know that there's going to be Delta Chi alumni in Nashville. So yeah, where were they? Because it was, it was a lot of social media out there. It was a lot of volunteers, Cajun Navy, people like that. But that was kind of one of the things, like I said, when you said it, it hit me like, where were they? They ran back to Missouri, and even if, and I think you're the one that said this, and, and I agree with it, even if the fraternity came out and said, like, at a higher level, clam up, be quiet, we're taking the silent approach on this, and this guy was my friend? Yeah, well, would, he you, really, would you listen to that when you were 20? But, I mean, no! I would have told him to go after no. themselves. Like, no. I mean, it, it's crazy. I mean, I only met you in Nashville, but that the night after I met you, if you went missing, I would have been looking for you, much less a brother of mine, like, I mean, if, if a fraternity brother would miss and I, there's nothing anybody could have done to clam me up. And then there was, someone else was saying, oh, they had to get back for tests. Well, you know, when, whenever there's a tragedy or anything at, at any major university, they allow students to take a leave of absence. There's no doubt in my mind, Mizzou would allow them to take time off on testing. And by the way, how, how good could these kids have, if they really were that distraught, like they're saying now, they probably didn't do well in the test anyway. Like, I mean, why would they make these kids take tests? You know, um, we know that, look, there's been problems at Mizzou in the past. I'm close to the Santilli family and the Santillis, you know, their son Danny was, you know, uh, you know, he's, he's basically a vegetable now. He's blind and he's, you know, in a wheelchair. And, why, don't you, why don't you tell them a little bit of story, the background on that story, if, if you're, uh, if you're you comfortable. Know, and there's criminal charges that, that came into play, but at Mizzou, at Fiji, they, uh, they um, they basically haze him, and the whole thing's on camera. They forced him to drink an entire bottle of alcohol, and um, you know the alcohol poisoning basically almost killed him. Uh, and now the family has to live the rest of their life with taking care of him. Um, there were multiple people that were charged with crimes, but but again, the 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 the, the attitude towards um, if this was the chess club or a soccer team, or, or better yet, if this was just kids messing around and this happened, it would be aggressively prosecuted. But when it comes to fraternities, they act like, oh, it's just boys being boys, and oh, it was an accident or whatever. And for whatever reason, most fraternity-related cases just don't ever end up usually in criminal charges or people in jail. The Santulis hired this lawyer named David Bianchi, who I know, and David really pressured the DA and the police to really 
pursue criminal charges. And it was only after them going to the press over and over again and the pressure from the public that that, that happened. Um, and when when I first started looking to Riley, I reached out to you know Tom Santulli, uh, you know, and Chrissy, who's um, who's Danny's aunt, saying, "Have you guys heard about what's going on in Nashville?" And Tom said, "Look, if the Strain family wants our help, we have a detective, at, you know, that, that handles Mizzou that will maybe put an eye on the Delta Cowboys." And I just find it very strange that you know the people who are with them who now are looking. No one wanted even to like look that way. You know, the police are very quick even on this case right now. And you and me were both on that bridge. I mean, by the bridge, like something doesn't feel right about it, you know, where they found the credit card. And, you know, I don't even know if I took a run and start and I dove off that cliff if I could have made it in the water. So, it, you know, okay, something bad probably happened. And most likely it had something, maybe it was a homeless I person. I lost, sound on you. I lost sound on you for a second there. Sorry, say that again. I said, it's most likely due to, uh, you know, a homeless person or something else that happened over there. You know, I'm not saying the fraternity did anything to him, but I don't know how he ended up in the water. Um, I mean, there, people don't realize how far the water is from the ledge. And even if you tumble down, I don't, I mean, remember I was talking about at the vigil. I'm like, I feel like getting a big dummy, a six foot seven dummy and throwing it off the ledge and see what happens. Because I don't think you could physically hit that water. And so and I repeat what I told you, if you get one, I will co I will throw it in for you and we'll film the whole thing. Again, so if you, know, you want to do it. The one thing is I never doubt the police. When, when remember everybody was jumping on the Koberger case thinking they weren't meanwhile the entire time they had a suspect and they executed and they got someone right. Um, maybe remember we saw these other, there's a lot of cameras around that area that that footage was never released. Maybe they have the incident on camera because the family was very quick to say, Oh, this was an accident or whatever. Um, yeah, I'm not a fall expert. Maybe you could fall off that, that ledge or, or maybe he fell off the ledge and a homeless person, you know, robbed him and then they threw his body in the water. Who knows? But when it comes to the paternity though, I do know that I knew the only fraternities act and it's always the same thing when any, anything ever happens, that's bad, whether they had something to do with it or not, it's this constant thing. You have to protect the house. You, everybody clams up. No one talks to anybody. They don't do interviews with the police. They just literally clam up. And, you know, they pretend like nothing happened. And then from what I saw, that's kind of what I saw in this instance. You know, if I'm wrong, I'm wrong. But the activity I saw on TikTok and on social media were for people like you and Olivia, not Delta Chi members. You know, Delta yeah. Chi had millions of dollars in the bank. Why, why, why weren't they doing a reward? Why weren't they doing promoted posts on social media? We know how effective social media could be. They weren't yeah. doing any of that. They weren't there at all there. You know, I was talking to one of the brothers um, and, you know, he, you know, one, the couple of things that he told me is, you know, one of the reasons, and obviously we don't know this yet. Um, Autopsy came back and said that it was accidental for Riley. Um, we're still waiting on toxicology that hasn't come back yet. Assuming that Nashville even gives us because Nashville does I have a tendency to a body in the water for two weeks. Toxicology would be compromised. It could be. It could be. Um, but the water's also cold, so I guess we'll see if they pull anything or not. Maybe they will. Maybe it'll be inconclusive. Okay. But you know, if but what I was told is that they've seen him drink, and he does not act like that when he drinks. And it looked to me like he was roofied. And apparently, when we did videos on that bar, all of a sudden we have a barrage of comments coming in saying like, "Oh, I was roofied at that bar. I was roofied. Oh, we were here for a bachelorette party. My friend was roofied. Oh, this person." And it was like. 20 comments, maybe more by the end of it, where people were all talking about their stories of being roofied in downtown Nashville. And obviously, that's not good for tourism, so they and might want to keep it under wraps. Again, like, whenever anything happens with a paternity, no, they don't want anything, they don't want to make it public because it's bad for business. Same thing at a university, and I imagine same thing with Tourism Bureau in Nashville. It would be disastrous for them if it was made public that people are getting drugged, in, especially on Broadway. Um in, in, you know, I almost agree with you, like watching that video, especially if you really did only have one drink, he was pretty messed up. That was when he fell going across that, you know, he was going across that one parking lot on the sidewalk. Um, that was, uh, that was, that was a little odd, you know, especially when people were saying he was fine right before. And then, you know, the weird thing is I have all these people that apparently have information and tips and they like, I did, 
you know, I was just there with, with Olivia and I was looking into stuff. And then I, that one TikToker guy posted that video of me. And next thing you know, I have all these people calling me saying, you know, um, I have video or I, uh, my friend saw him walking and heard him on the phone with someone and the police aren't listening to us. So now let's, let's give the police credit. They probably got annihilated with, you know, thousands, if not tens of thousands of tips. Right. I'm positive. You're right. Yeah, I'm, I'm positive. You're right. Sure because you know, I've been around these situations. I'm pretty sure of them. A lot of them are from cuckoo doodles too, that woke up in the middle of the night saying God came to him and said, this is what happened. But, um, there are people that, Man, are, that I've done that peep. Somebody literally asked me if it was the, like, have you heard the rapture theory? And I was like, y'all think he was I had, raptured. I had a couple of psychics. <laughs> and so, you know, I so look, I get it. They're inundated, but there are people that are being sound pretty credible to me that are like, begging me to help get information to the family or whatever. It just feels I mean, like, again, it, remember on Coburger, everybody thought they weren't doing anything and they were then shitting on the police and turns out all along they had, they knew what they were doing, but there are, you know, there are people that feel that that are saying they have very detailed information and they aren't getting any love from the police or anything. The police are very quick to say it's an accident. We're putting guardrails up. Yeah. I, I, you know, the whole thing just doesn't feel right. And it feels like something else happened in that vicinity there. Cause someone just doesn't end up in, in the river, um, in that area. And remember when we were there, when in the three day period, three people fell off the cliff, right. Or didn't they, yeah, they found I mean, two and then a homeless person fell in and they rescued him or him or her. And she was, they were alive and none of them, none of them made it in the water. So I, I just don't see. I don't know where, you know, especially where his credit card was found. I just don't, I mean, I, I, I don't know how you can end up in that water there. The only other thing is, cause you know, if his phone was pinged underneath the bridge, maybe he could have been on top. Maybe he went up that staircase there and was going over the bridge and maybe someone was chasing him and he jumped in the water thinking he can get away from not realizing how high it is. I, I don't know. It just, it, it just feels odd to me that that whole situation, but the behavior from the fraternity seems odd. So, they're posted on social media now. They're, they put a post out, you know, you know, please respect our privacy. Our hearts go to the family, you know. And to me, that's a little too late, you know, too little, too late. Um, you know, yeah. I, I just don't know what that. You know, you get sold on the notion of brotherhood. So the 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 biggest um, takeaway from this is, if you're joining a fraternity for that lifelong brotherhood that people have your back no matter what, well, you probably shouldn't join a fraternity because. This is proof that the notion of brotherhood as they sell it is not there. Um, you know, I was in a fraternity in, you know, 1990, 1991 too, in that area. And like, it was a little tighter back then. But one thing I've seen is that, you know, these are glorified drinking clubs now. They act like gangs. In my opinion, there's just no real brotherhood anymore. Um, it's all about money. The national only cares that you pay your dues and they keep their, uh, you know, their little game going. But you know, everything that they say on their website about building upstanding gentlemen. And I just think it's all horseshit. Yeah. So I'll, I'll say this on that, on that note with what you said. So, um, I told you that I was, a, I was a teak, but I didn't finish college a teak. I, I quit the fraternity and here's the reason why, um, it was very clear that you had some members that were there because they really wanted those members there. And then you had members that were there because you knew that they were going to pay their dues on time. Um, I was more the latter. My dad was at the time was covering my fraternity dues and, and every, you know, every time they needed the dues, they were there, they were on time. And the, the one moment that really spoke to me, and I will say this, I have really good friends to this day that were in the fraternity that I met with the fraternity, they're lifelong friends. But there was one person who, um, during his pledging, he was the class right after me, um, during his pledging thought about quitting. He was very upset and literally the entire fraternity, let's all go to his house. Let's go. We're going to talk to him. We're going to make him feel welcome. And we did. That's what we did. But then I'm sitting there while this is going on and I'm like, when I was struggling and I was thinking about quitting, not one of these, including, you know, my big brother showed up for me. And I'm like, it's bullshit. And after that, I resigned. So, um, you know, it, I, I agree with that statement is that I just really feel that it's, it's pick and choose. And maybe, maybe Riley was, was just a paycheck to them. Well, we saw, you know, fraternities have changed drastically over the past, especially 15 years. Um, I've been studying fraternities for the past eight and a half years. I've done now five, five films on fraternities. 
Um, two of them won Emmy Awards. Um, I'm, my 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 newest project, Protect the House, is an eight part docu series, and we've shot it almost over the past, almost five years now. And we have 450 hours of content, 230 interviews, everything from university presidents to FBI agents to uh, se you know Senator Klobuchar, Lindsey Graham, and Senator Casey. Um, we do a real deep dive into the system and how it got this way. And from what I see, like where things started really going awry, we started seeing a drastic change with fraternities, the way they operate and how things run, are run. Right around the time Gary Diversely Jr. died in 2007. If you notice, 2007 was a big year because that's when we really started seeing social media really come into play the yeah. way it is now. You know, Facebook started really taking off. And what happened is, you know, I think the nationals were just asleep at the wheel. They didn't realize how powerful social media would become. So remember, when you were a teak and I was a SIG app, what went on at fraternities in, in some respects, like when we had meetings or initiations, it was secret. And that was cool back then. Our society kind of shifted, especially over the past decade, where it's almost cooler to share secrets than it is to keep secrets. And people, you know, we started seeing almost a competition-based thing where a lot of fraternities, like we have a whole section in Protect House where we have well over 100 videos that were sent to me. I have videos of kids being waterboarded being shocked with car batteries, uh, being forced to do like Navy SEAL training in the middle of the ocean, like crazy shit, branded, just nutty, nutty stuff that I never really saw. It didn't really exist like they do now. And a lot of that started really getting crazy back, you know, around Gary dying. Gary was forced to drink a bottle of, Patron, of um, Absolute Citron Vodka. And again, remember, we started transitioning from beer to now flavored alcohol, right? Vodka and stuff, mm -hmm. uh, you know. But now it's progressed almost every death that we're seeing now, whether it's, you know, Adam Oaks or Nolan Birch, it's whiskey and it's, or it's grain alcohol. And, um, and sometimes drugs are combined with it. And sometimes the methods of the hazing is much more vicious because it's almost like a badge of honor. These kids film these things and then post it on social media to try to one up each other. And it's like a bragging thing. Like, look what I went through. I really earned it. And what they don't realize is, is, you know, you could kill people and people are dying, you know, and they can, you know, fortunately we didn't have a death last year that we know of. Uh, we won't know for sure ever because paternity, hazing is not a crime in some states. It's only a felony in 15 states right now. And um, most of the times it goes unreported. So sometimes when there is a, an incident from hazing, it's chalked off as a kid just partying too much or, you know, um, it, it, you know, it's just, it, it, even if it is something more nefarious, like maybe someone, you know, got tortured or whatever, the fraternity will go out of their way to cover it up. But we're seeing um, a drastic change of the behavior. And unfortunately, the nationals have done nothing to control that. And so, you know, almost every case I've covered, whether it's, you know, Nolan Birch, I did a film called Breathe, Nolan Breathe. He died at WVU as a Kappa Sigma. To this day, you know, I made that film I won an Emmy for it in 2019, but we put it out in 2018. But I have, and then that film was like, it's an educational film. And so we worked with the family on it. And the purpose was to save lives and create awareness and like get people to call 911. And you would think that Kappa Sigma would want to participate in that and help us. We've reached, I can't tell you how many times I reached out to Kappa Sigma. In fact, I think the last time I spoke to someone there, they told me to send a message to the family to move on. And it's it's just utterly insane. Like, and so my my opinion on fraternities has changed drastically because we spoke about this earlier. I had a good experience in college. I was a SIG app, um, and I admit I was hazed and I hazed others, but it was nothing like I've seen today. And I wasn't tormented, but it was never put in a dangerous situation. Um, and I see dangerous situations more often than I see safe situations right now. And people need to be aware of it. And because uh, the universities aren't going to do anything, you know, my daughter's in college right now. And, you know, the crazy thing is, if you look at all these, you know, all these kids who have died, you know, whether it's Tim Piazza at Penn State or, you know, um, uh, Nolan Birch at WVU or Adam Oaks at VCU or, you know, uh, Tucker Hips at, uh, at Clemson, these aren't, some of these aren't fly-by-night universities. And so, you know, if my son was going to Clemson, I would have an expectation that they're going to keep him safe and they would never let any organization organize at the university that has a, a, a track record or pattern of doing anything dangerous or anything illegal. 
So the thing that fascinates me, you can't really name one fraternity, not one, not Teak or SIGEP, my fraternity, not ATO or Pike, or any of these guys. Every one of them, everyone has multiple sexual assaults, multiple drug, uh, you know, crimes and charges. Mo I mean, dozens and dozens of hazard incidents. Like, there's not one national fraternity that had that that is clean. So why do these universities still allow them? Like, I would if I was a university president, I'd be like, great. I'll let you guys organize. You can have a chapter here when you quit the bullshit, when you figure out how you're going to keep your people safe. Because you know what the irony of this is? This is a great um, example. You know, now all this, there's all this shit going on with Bowen right now, right? I remember mm -hmm. a year and a half ago when the, the first issues they had with the 737 Max 8s, they grounded them because they yep. went fresh. Well, this is, this is as crazy as kids are dying in these schools. They clearly don't have it under control. So they know... Because Hazen has gotten worse. There's more incidents of Hazen right now. And it's not because we're more aware because of social media. No, it's far worse than it ever was. And they keep investing money in Hazen prevention. They have parents come speak to the kids. They put them through workshops. None of it's working. None of it. And, and if it is working, then we're really in trouble. Because without that, it would be really bad. But it's super bad already now. Like Kids are really having a hard time. And they have no idea how to fucking control this, but yet they're continuing to fly the planes. So can you imagine if like the CEO of United came out and said, yep, we know another Boeing plane is going to crash this week, but we're going to keep fucking flying them anyway. Well, I mean, they kind of are doing that, but I mean, it's like collateral damage. Yeah. Like they know that another kid's on, you know, oh, probably going to die here soon. They know that they have no control over their Greek life. Uh, these fraternities are running amok. They're acting like gangs. There's no way to control them. And, uh, you know, and and then even when they do take action, like, you know, at WVU, WVU, Gordon Gee uh, suspended or he expelled seven fraternities. And what do they do? They hired lawyers and they filed a, a federal lawsuit against the university for their right to organize under the Constitution. Then they started operating rogue and they formed their own independent, you know, IFC. And so... Boy, that's a great way to teach your kids how to respect authority. Say, no, don't worry about it. We don't care if the school wants you or not. We're going to let you to continue to operate. That makes them even worse when they go underground and rogue, and then they feel empowered because they feel protected and now like the rebels. And then they just step it up even more. And the boys that are going to those fraternities are now being literally tortured. And there's all sorts of shit going on. Like one of the fraternities that suspended at WVU, I've been following for a couple of years, and they're in my series. I know they've been dealing cocaine out of there. I know they've had, you know, uh, several, several sexual assaults that have gone and reported. I've, I've spoken to a couple of the girls. I mean, it's just insane. And I've actually, I have spoken to the administration. I have spoken to the police chief there. And the police chief was like, well, we need proof. I'm like, what do you, I'm giving you details. It's not my job to do your job. Do yeah. your job. Like, but Unfortunately, a university, you know, so this expectation, if you send your kid to school, that every organization at that school is above board and operating properly is bullshit. And parents need to be aware of what's happening. And um, because the university president is beholden to the donors and the majority of donors at these big schools are were ex-Greek. And so they're the ones that, that donate the money every year. And so they're never going to challenge those people because without the money, schools don't operate. Well, I want to ask you a question, then I want to come back to that because you, you and I spoke about something before we went live. Um, and Adam, I, we didn't talk about this part, but I'm just curious when you're studying Greek life and, and you're seeing these issues with hazing and the dangers that are going along with it, um, are you seeing the same type? Like, what are you seeing with sororities? Is there anything so anywhere? Sororities are, so, sororities are a little different. Sororities haze, um, it's a little, they, they, they push a little more on the mental thing than physical. I mean, there are some that do physical activity, but the reason why sororities actually, we don't see as many incidents. Most sororities, well, actually almost all sororities have what's called house mothers. So if your daughter was in a sorority, even when if you go visit your daughter and you go to the sorority house, you're not even allowed to enter where the living quarters are. You have to stay in the living room. They sign you in. Sororities are actually, the houses are run a lot more effectively and safer. Um, those girls are protected. You know, and, and boys are a little crazier, but, you know, you put 50 or 60 boys in a house alone with no supervision and drugs and alcohol. What the hell do you think is going to happen? 
you don't have that problem with sororities because they don't put 50 or 60 girls alone. There's always an adult there supervising and there's a different kind of culture. Um, and, you know, historically, um, you know, boys and fraternities have been a little more rambunctious anyway, and a little more aggressive, um, but they do haze. A lot of it's mental. They'll circle the fat on the body. I mean, a lot, there's a lot of girls like I, uh, Lucy Taylor works with us. She has the snap podcast. You know, she had a horrible time as alpha as an alpha fee at University of Maryland. She's very outspoken about it. Um, you know, there were things done to her that are affecting her rest of the life. So, you know, it does happen. Uh, we're not seeing the deaths, although we did see um, we did see a death a couple of years ago. Uh, Gracie Demit died. Uh, she was at Emory College, um, and I, I she was being forced to like drift the car. I think she was uh, Kappa Phi Alpha. I think she was, but anyway. But that was like the first female hazing-related death that we saw in a long time. Uh, so, you know, the majority of the deaths and the really barbaric stuff is coming from the, the, the boys, though. And so right now, and by the way, hazing's everywhere. Hazing's on the soccer team in middle school. It's in the football team. It, I mean, it's in the military. It's at the police. I mean, hazing's everywhere. And so right now, though, my focus is on fraternities. And when I get done with fraternities, then I will probably move on and do it and show it elsewhere because it's a form of bullying and it's everywhere. And social media just fucking blew it up. It, it was like a nuclear bomb. And then, you know, and then someone actually pressed the button to explode the bomb during, you know, COVID. When kids came back from COVID, it was like, it, it just exploded. Um, every day I see shit that I'm like, and, I, and by the way, I thought I've every, I always say, I, I think I've seen it all by now. Holy moly. I, you know, I, I don't know about you, but like if we were pledging together and I want to be in a fraternity, how bad I wanted to, if they told me that I had to eat a bucket of your shit, I probably would say I'm out. I want to have nothing to do with this. I'd, I'd be a night. Thank you. I'm not, and, and, and it, it's, it's completely insane that, how far they're pushing these guys. And, uh, and by the way, that's dangerous to do. And like, it's just the stuff they're having people do. And then why would you want to be brothers with someone that makes you do something like that? I mean, you know, and then, you know, the biggest thing is, you know, we go into the code of silence really big time and protect the house. And, you know, most of the boys that I've covered, whether it's Adam Oaks or um, even Tucker Hips, who fell off a bridge um, or Nolan Birch, Gary Diversely, these boys would be alive today if someone just called 911. The fact that they don't call 911, they try to cover it up, they wait. That's why these boys are dead. And um, so the first thing I always try to teach people is just by staring awareness. Like, fuck your fraternity. If someone's in need of help, call 911. I'd like, there's never a point in my life where I would ever put a club or organization I was in ahead of someone's life. And and that's that's how things have changed. Uh, if, if, you know, if it's a brotherhood, you're supposed to have your brothers. But the way these fraternities kind of operate, is that, you know, if you get in trouble, so we're brothers until something happens to you. If something happens to you, you're on your own. So yep. I mean, think that's why I think you even a Riley Strain, same thing. Yeah. You know, it's very textbook Delta Chi to me. Um, you know, he went missing and they're like, fuck it, he's on his own. We don't want the fraternity to get snagged up in this. Because that's like, I mean, I I don't know what how they can excuse their behavior because I would have thought they would have been down there. They would have rented bloodhounds. I don't know what where the fraternity was. Yeah, and there's money with the fraternity. Their parents could have had, you know, there's ways that they could have, you know, had a place at least where a handful of them stay and search. But again, I, I agree with you. And it's, and then it becomes, you know, with my experience, you know, I would not, you know, if I, you know, tell my kids or tell anybody, hey, you should join a fraternity. But when you look at, you know, the stories that you're sharing, you look at Riley Strain and like, the minute something happens, you're abandoned. You're not part of this. You're not their brother anymore. You're just gone. You know, on, on the Adam Oaks case, you know, Adam Oaks was a Delta Chi. OK, um, I got to work with some of the boys who actually hazed him to death. So in lieu of jail time, the Oaks family, I worked with the Oaks family and there was alternate sentencing where they uh, the boys were um, uh, they went through a program where they apologized to the family. But then they worked with us and they participated in a film I made called Death of a Pledge. And then they went on a tour and we went and spoke at universities and one of the one of the kids who did this is kid jason who's the president who was the president of alta at the time and wonderful kid and when i when i inter when i interviewed him for the film and even after it, i talked to him about it you know he had his national advisor who he spoke to all the time he you know he was the president and 
Um, and he said that when um, when Adam died that morning, he called his national advisor, uh, you know, saying Adam Oaks died. And, you know, here is supposed to be your mentor. The office is supposed to have your back, like, because he's calling him, like, what do we do? Uh, Adam Oaks is dead. And the guy says to him, you're going to hang up the phone. You're going to delete the website, all social media channels, and take the letters off the house and never call me again. From this point forward, Delta Chi doesn't exist at, at VCU. And I looked at him. I said, how's that brotherhood treating you now? Something goes wrong. They have a tragedy with one of their brothers, and then the, the national just ditches their ass. That's that, their chicken shits at Delta Chi. Um, you know, they're supposed to be harboring a safe environment and, and promoting brotherhood, and, and instead they just left all those boys. And this whole thing, the, the common thing with all these fraternities is, oh, it's a bad bunch of kids. Okay, well then, if that's the case, and you guys for over 50 years, there's been a fraternity death up until the past year, or two there's deaths almost every there was a death for like 50 years straight but if you want to just tell me it's bad seeds so if you guys have if your organizations are attracting these bad seeds and it keeps happening over and over again well maybe you should change the way you run your damn organizations um and you know this should happen so you know that it's a it's a potentially lethal um situation if one of your um if one of your you know members is bad and put in one of these situations, it could lead to someone's death. So I would think that puts more of a responsibility on the on these nationals. They're they're very aware of what happens when a bad seed then gets in. And yet they do not, they haven't done anything to change the way they recruit. And they haven't really done anything even the way they train people about hazing. It's the same shit over and over again. And nothing, nothing against some of the things that are done. But and I, I I don't think that the solution is with the boys. I have yet to meet a bad kid. I've met now dozens of kids that were involved in hazing incidents that resulted in a death. And I honestly could say I haven't really met a bad kid. No one intended to hurt anybody. But you got to remember, the male brain isn't fully developed till 25. So you're going to make bad decisions when you're 19, 20, 21. And, the, you know, the adults in the room, the people running these organizations... Why do they consistently get let off the hook? So I don't know about you, but if you're going to send your kid to school and they want to join an organization where no one in the administration or at the top has any kind of liability, that if your son dies at a fraternity, that you can't touch any of the people that make these bad decisions that put them there. Even though now we know Delta Chi had Adam Oaks died three years ago. So they know that these situations result in, a de in deaths, and yet they continue to allow the fraternities to operate the same way. So why on earth would you want your kid to join Delta Chi? And now, you know, you throw in on how they acted in Riley Strain's case. You know, I, I'm sorry. If he was on a soccer team, they were there on a tournament and, and a member went missing. You know damn well that soccer team would have been everywhere. Absolutely. So that's, you had people who didn't even know him looking for him. You had people who didn't even know him trying to find him. and His own brothers weren't there. And I know people were shitting on me online like, oh, his brothers were, were, were more, you know, terribly upset. I'm like, well, well, then where are they? There's nothing that anybody could say to me to have made me go home. Nothing. And if the cops are out there with like with, with search and rescue teams and helicopters and drones and bloodhounds and camping, you know, maybe, you know, I would say, okay, I'm going to let them do their job. But as you know, they weren't. They weren't. They weren't. If they were, then the TikToker wouldn't have found the debit card. And then they, and as you know, they didn't rope off that area. They didn't search that, for anything. That, that, that's the most bizarre thing. So I understand before they found the card, they didn't know what they're dealing with. Now they have evidence that maybe something bad happened and they still didn't treat it like a crime scene. We're all walking around down there. We're all, you were down. I, did you go? I went down the hill. We're all like trampling all over what could potentially be a crime scene. They didn't do a damn thing to, to, to do anything to preserve evidence or try to figure out what happened. Because you know why? A story of a kid too drunk and falling off a hill, that that will come and go, and that's not Excuse bad me. for tourism. Yeah, that's easy. That's easy. And we don't have to do anything about that. That works for the fraternity. It works for, um, it works for um, uh, the city. And maybe to a certain respect, it maybe even works for the family because they can you know start to have closure and maybe move on. But... I just find it so hard to believe after spending so much time there, you know, that there wasn't something else to it. That's all. I, I, I just, you know, and, and seeing the way the paternity operates, because that, that was the weird thing. Okay. We, 
I'm, we're all looking around each other. It's been over 10 days. And we're and like the fraternity, like you would have thought they would have gotten more aggressive. And the same thing happened up in Idaho, right? Um, mm -hmm. Like the fraternity didn't cooperate at all. Like, and now we know they had nothing to do with it. Well, what, what, why the hell? Like, climbed up. They're so worried about getting their fraternity in trouble or being implicated in something that they just, they don't, they don't have it in them to do what's right. And that's what's alarming of what's happened in the Greek system today. Um, they literally are acting like they're fucking the mafia. Uh, in fact, I have an FBI agent in my thing saying he sees a higher sense of loyalty and a stronger code of silence with fraternities these days than he does the Bloods, Crips, Mexican mob, or the Russian mob, or the Italian mob, which is crazy because if you see something in the Russian mob or Italian mob and you talk about it, your, your family's going to get butchered. We're, but like, you know, if something happens at a fraternity and you talk about the fraternity, your family's not getting killed. And so I, I don't understand how much allegiance, especially the pledges, how much allegiance could you have to something that you're not even really a part of yet? Like in the, I'll give you a great example, Tucker Hips. He died in 2014 at Clemson. It's going to be 10 years this year. He went on a pledge run. He was a SIG app in my fraternity. Um, very suspicious circumstances, but he, 30 people went on the run, 29 came back. The 29 that came back claimed they didn't see a thing. They don't know what happened to them. The 911 call the next day is extremely suspicious. Um, who the hell calls 911 saying, did you find anybody by the side of the road? Um, they found him dead in the bottom of a lake. No one's talked. And, they, and there was, you know, probably a couple hundred people that probably know what happened that night. Um, you know, the security camera footage of paternity coming back from the road. You don't have audio, but they clearly were distraught. There's a lot of conflicting stories, but it's a mystery what happened to them. And despite there being $125,000 reward, which I helped raise, and by the way, $125,000 in that area of South Carolina, you could buy a house with that. That's real money. Yeah. You know, and now you got to think some of these kids now are like 27, 28. They have families now. Why won't they give this family closure? And that's the other crazy thing. At the time, Hazen wasn't a felony. So even the, the boys who had something to do with it, even if they were came forward now, they would just get probation. And the civil cases are done. They were all the boys have already been sued. So why not just give the family closure and move on? And how could people do that? How cruel can they be to take that to their grave? And not this family, Cindy Hips just can't move on until she knows that she wants to know what happened to her boy. And these kids are so selfish that they just will play stupid. And by the way, in that case, same thing. They all lawyered up. No one talked to the cops. I'm sorry, like, especially if I was a pledge. I'm not even a brother yet. If something happened to one of my brothers and he died, I'd be the first one at the police station. I mean, give me like 100%. Someone, someone lost their life. Like, why are you being loyal to something that you weren't even part of? Even SIGEP, they chipped into the reward. SIGEP National saying, hey, we want to know what happened. If you did this or no, who did it, come forward. And for whatever reason, these kids are sworn to secrecy and taking it to their grave. I, I, I don't understand that. And so, yeah. I, and the reason I'm shouting from rooftops is because. You won't hear that story when, you know, when your mom or dad is looking into your, you go to college and you want to join a fraternity, your parents aren't going to find that story online. And the biggest reason why is, and this is why the system's broken. Do you ever hear of the Cleary Act? I have not. So the Cleary Act is a, is a, is, is a bill that was passed after June Cleary, um, her daughter was killed at Lehigh University. And then they had a federal bill passed that reports campus crime. So... And it's a thorough bill and everything's on that thing from murder to rape, to theft, to burglary, manslaughter, even incest is on the list. They left haze enough. Okay. So every university in the country is federally mandated to do a clear report and report campus crime, I think quarterly. And you know, it, it does affect their funding from the department of education, but they have to make public what happens at their universities, right? For whatever reason, Hazen was left off that bill, all right? So there is no legal obligation for a university or for a fraternity to publicize that they had a Hazen incident. So if there's a Hazen incident, they, they usually, the way it usually happens is in term, they usually hand it internally with a, if there's a police force at a university, they hand it internally. And then they usually do it with the, um, with the fraternal, or, you know, they have their own court and they, they it's very hush hush. It's never made public unless somehow the press finds out about it. But even then, most people don't know the final outcome. 
And you'll never find any record of any incident ever being on the university website or the fraternity. Now, in some states like South Carolina, after Tucker died, the Tucker Transparency Act was passed. And now in Virginia, Adams Law was passed. We have Matt's Law in California. But in most states, it's very hush-hush. So now they're trying to get a bill passed. And my movie, I follow these parents on this journey now. In the case of like Julie and Gary Diversely, they've been, they started out by having this thing called the REACH Act. But now it's called Stop the Campus Hazen Act. And what they did, they're trying to do is almost like an extension of the Cleary Act. It's just transparency. It's a vanilla, nonpartisan bill that just puts transparency. So if there's a Hazen dent or a Hazen incident at a university, the university is not allowed to cover it up. They have to publicize it. And this fucking thing has been kicked around now for almost nine years. I have everybody from Amy Klobuchar to Lindsey Graham on camera promising the families they're going to get it passed. Here we are, no fucking bill. Kids are dying. Adam Oaks would be alive today if that bill was passed four years ago, like they said it would. And, you know, and now we find out that most of the people that are not, you know, supporting this thing, we're all Greek. And so they don't want the system to change. They don't want to talk Could about what happens. Give this, a, we, before we got on, um, you told me some of the stats with our legislative body and uh, the the percentages of Greek. Would you mind sharing that with the listeners? So it, it shifted a little more now. It's a little more even, but it was like seventy six or seven years ago. At one point, eighty one percent of the Senate, seventy seven percent of Congress, and sixty four percent of Supreme Court justices were Greek. Um, so that 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 might have been the problem back then, because the people who actually create the laws were all Greek, and so they don't want to go against the system. Um, that you know that they're proud to be part of, and I'll be I'll be honest with you. When I first started doing this, I got involved in this because I went to West Virginia University. Um, I was very proud. Of, I I really was supportive of the school. I love everybody there, and they had a death with Nolan Birch. And I remember um, being at home in California one day, and I saw it on Dateline, and and I didn't like the way the school was portrayed. And I reached out to Gordon Gee asking how I can help, and. We came up with a plan and I put money up and the school put money up and we created Breed Nolan and Breed to, to try to do bystander awareness. But when I started realizing how deep this was, that the lawmakers and then more importantly, how the universities operate, that university presidents, I mean, I gave you a stat before that I find more startling than 81% of the Senate. The biggest thing I find out was I asked 13 university presidents what their number one job is and 12 out of 13 told me raise money. And it should be the safety of their kids. You know, they are glorified politicians that go out and raise money. And uh, they're beholden to their donors. And, and they can't do anything to upset the donor base. And in some schools, you know, like Vanderbilt and um, Clemson, you have an excess of 75 80% of the active donors that are Greek. And so what do you do? How do you go against those people? You know, every time a university president tries to stand up to them, they get annihilated. And I think that's what's happening in Washington. Um, the, the senators and cause let's face it, you know, I appreciate what she's done for the family. She gives them an audience. She meets with them consistently, but we all know that Senator Casey or Senator Graham or Amy Klobuchar is one of the most powerful senators in, in, on, on the Hill. If she wants to get a bill passed, especially a nonpartisan vanilla bill, she can get that shit passed in a day. She could walk across the hall go the other side, they could trade off on maybe gun rights, whatever, who fucking knows. But if she really wanted to pass a bill, she knows how to push it through. She's been around long enough, right? And so mm -hmm. why is this taking almost a decade? Um, you know, especially they they had the, there was the End All, End All Hazen Act and the um, Reach Act, and they agreed to merge them about a year ago. And they, they were told that by merging these bills, it would be like, hotlined or it would then definitely pass and that was like last like end of summer early fall and they had full like every, families were excited and they thought this bill is finally going to get fucking passed in the fall and then fall came then winter came and now it's spring and we're going into an election there's no way in fucking hell anything's getting passed until after the election which now here we are again they're going to come up on almost 10 years trying to get federal legislation passed to keep our kids safe and the senators don't care they uh, can do a TikTok ban in four up. days. What but they that? can do a TikTok ban in four days. They can't get yeah. this done, but in four days, they can pass a TikTok ban. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So they're more concerned about TikTok ban, which is utterly insane, than, than, than transparency at schools. You know, who in their right mind 
would be against a school having to report crimes on campus. I, I, I honestly don't understand it. So one of the things I'm trying to do is I'm not trying to like, and I get accused all the time of being anti-Greek and I get into it once in a while. I'm not anti-Greek. Go ahead, join a fraternity. Don't, don't hurt people and don't kill people. And universities, you have to be transparent. Like you can't cover up crimes. And like, you know, there's even creepy shit like, you know, and, and Antonio Cialis, you know, he, they found him dead in the bottom of a gorge at Cornell University. You know, the university is letting their internal police force handle that investigation. They have no leads, nothing. You know, when I heard the state crime lab offered to help them and they said no, like when there's a fraternity related death at a university, they shouldn't be allowed to investigate internally. They should always have to have an, an external organization come in because we know just like you said, like a kid getting roofied in downtown Nashville is very bad for tourism. A fraternity related death is not only bad for the school, but it's also bad for the fraternity. And there's big money in fraternities, you know, hundreds of millions Absolutely. of dollars in real estate. Um, and fraternities don't want to disrupt that system because that's where the gravy train's coming from. So everybody participates to try to cover these things up. And we do have clear evidence of cover ups. Uh, I have multiple universities that just turned, they chose to turn a blind eye. They don't do anything. I have one university, I mean, I'll say their name, Clemson has really done nothing, in my opinion, to support Tucker Hitt's family. Uh, we've re repeatedly asked them to do an interview, Jim Clements, the, the president, uh, about Tucker's case to try to help us find out what happened. The family is repeatedly, for 10 years now, asked to meet with him. And they just, they for whatever reason, uh, he won't do it. And it doesn't make sense because the civil suits are over. Um, why wouldn't the university want to shout it from the rooftops to try to find out what happened to Tucker? because they, they want it to go away because they don't want a family in Ames, Iowa, Google, oh, my son wants to go to Clemson and Google and Clemson University and it comes up with a kid mysteriously dying there. That's bad for business. And when, you know, the, the really screwed up thing is, I don't know about you, but I would feel better about sending my kid to a school where someone died, especially if the university was going out of their way to try to fix things and, you know. Agreed. Because, you can't really, these days, you can't get away from stuff with social media and stuff. So I just don't know why they continue to turn a blind eye and just ignore things. Just like, you know, Delta Chi, I don't know what the reason it was. Even now, um, you know that some of those brothers can't, are pro probably have some of the same questions that you and me have and, and the other people who are down on that site have. And why are they being so silent? Why is the university, why is the, why is Delta Chi fraternity saying respect our privacy? There'll be no comments at this time. Why are they not being very vocal about the fact, you know, maybe, maybe, maybe one of them agrees that maybe something happened. Someone is roofied. Why aren't they saying something? I, I, I don't understand it. And, uh, because and, how he was, if they drink with him and they've been friends with him, they know how he acts when he drinks. And so if he was roofied and he was acting off, they know. Didn't you and, say one of the brothers, was it you that said, talked to a brother and went on spring break? Yeah, he went on spring break, but I was talking to him. How weird is yeah. that? Your, your brother's missing. After a week goes by, something clearly isn't right. And then you go on spring break? Yeah, I, I mean, it's, it didn't sit well with me. I, I mean, how it could sit well with anybody. So... Again, like, you know, I, I I lost my temper the other night on the bridge, but it was incredibly emotional being there, right? And it was. It, it was hard to be there and like to only see volunteers like the Cajun Navy and us. Like, where the fuck were the cops? But I guess the cops can't really do much. Or maybe, you know, and by the way, technology these days, we don't they, they could have they could have the whole thing on video and they could be working behind the scenes. But the brothers aren't aware of that. Why weren't they there? on that river where the Cajun Navy was, I, or, or at least paying for it or hire it. Like, it, you know, Delta Chi has millions of dollars in the bank. Spend 50 grand and try to find one of your brothers and bring him home to his mother. I and agree. The mother, the mother went on and said, oh, the fraternity brothers loved them. Okay. Well, why weren't they there looking for your boy? I, I mean, I, I just, you know, and you know, from what I've known, it, it's just sad to what's happened to Greek life. You know, I, I feel like, the people who are running Greek life are the most irresponsible people in the world, and they don't want to, uh, you know, acknowledge the fact and embrace the fact that times are different. We need to run this, run, run the system differently these these days because 
it's different. You know, no, I look when I was 18, 19, I didn't, I hated when old people would tell me, Oh, well, times were different then, but you know what? When we went to college, times were different from when our parents went to college, but they're really different now. I mean, mm -hmm. social media has really changed shit. And here's the other problem that you have. This is why what scares me about the future. We do know that uh, we're dealing with a team mental health crisis and it was exasperated by, um, by COVID. And so we have a lot of kids in the key years where the brain develops, where you learn how to deal with everything from let down to taking care of yourself to even stupid shit, like learn how to do laundry, you know, at 13 to 17, um, these, we have a lot of kids, the generation in college now were COVID kids and they were locked up at home. And then they also didn't interact with their friends. So it's hard enough these days in a social media world to develop social skills because they don't know how to even have a conversation because they're on cell phones. But when they couldn't even be in the same room together, kids are now going off to college totally unequipped to deal with any kind of letdown or failure. And then they get put in a situation where they're put in a fucking lineup by a fraternity. That's, that's a disaster waiting to happen. You can't deal with kids. We can't follow rituals and stuff that are archaic. Like kids today aren't equipped to deal with that type of pressure. And it's a scary thing. They're not only doing things like they used to do years ago when kids aren't, but they're actually making it worse now because they're trying to, and they all videotape it, which is insane because some places there's no risk. Like it's like a badge of honor. When we started doing protect the house, we were reaching out to kids. I had all these interns. We reach out to kids on like Yik Yak and Reddit and everywhere. And they're like proudly sending us videos of them torturing other kids because you want to know why? In most of the States, it's not even a crime. It's not even a misdemeanor. Like you can legally haze someone in Alaska and, and you could brag about it and post it on social media. And not only, not only is it not illegal and you can't get in trouble as long as someone's trying to join a fraternity, um, but it doesn't even violate the terms of use on Instagram or, or Facebook. So I guess the moral of the story is if you want to run a criminal organization, you want to hurt people, just start a fraternity. And you could do whatever the fuck you want in some places because it, it's like, oh, I was hazing them for membership that had nothing to do with the money he owed me. That was because he wants to be in my fraternity and the, but, Oh, okay. No problem. I mean, it's literally that crazy at this point. And so, you know, I, I don't understand it. Um, you know, the kids are participating in things that are resulting in people dying. You know, there's a crime on the book. It's a, it's a, it's a great crime. It's called manslaughter. And unfortunately there are lots of people in prison who are great people, right? Manslaughter is for good people who make bad, bad mistakes. Unfortunately, if you do something that results in someone's death, you should see jail time. And you, you know, and, and that's what manslaughter is. Sure. I mean, so the crazy thing is if you and me went out drinking while we were in Nashville and I drove home drunk and you died, I would certainly go to prison, right? But for whatever reason, if I premeditate and I plan to take you back to the fraternity house and waterboard you and shock your nuts and then and then put you in a cold dungeon and throw hot water and honey on you and then shock you and then you died. Oh, nope, that's hazing. That that's a that's a it's a fine and 30 days uh mr you know probation. I I I don't get it. Something's I mean, gotta change. Something's gotta change. Um well, it's not, it's not changing. So that that's part of the problem. And you know, these guys have to stop the bullshit. And um, you know. I don't think it's the kids. I think we got to focus on the people on the top, the people that are running these organizations. You know, people need to reach out to people like Judd Horace from the NIC. Uh, the NIC is an organization where a lot of the nationals are belong up. We need to start letting them know that we need them to put pressure on the members of the organizations to change the way they do things. Um, that right, let's talk about that. Let's talk about that for a second because I know we're getting we're getting close on time with it. What a lot of my listeners, a lot of my followers love to help impact and affect change. So what specifically can they, should they do to try to start making a difference with this and putting pressure on people? Well, no, no, number one, I think the first thing we could do, I think the most powerful thing that's going to change things is transparency because as long as the people who run these organizations are allowed to hide, and as long as they're protected from the truth coming out, it's very easy for them to just blame bad kids or, you know, and, so I think that getting um, the, the Stop Campus Hazen Act passed is essential. So they can reach out to their local congressman or senator and say, we want the, um, uh, the Stop Campus Hazen Act passed. Show your support for it. Because 
you know, one of the things that really frustrates me is a lot of people around me are like, you're still working in Hazen? How many films have you done? Like, it's not even that big of a problem. I, it frustrates me that I hear that consistently. It's not that big of a problem. I think it's actually a much bigger problem than anybody knows. We don't hear about it because the system is set up in a way that protects the people who do it and they don't have to be transparent. So transparency is probably the first big thing that could really fuck the system up. The other thing is, um, you know, we should try to get creative with our bills. Like, you know, if you want to open up a bar in Nashville, um, you have to have a liquor license. So you can get a liquor license for your corporation, but guess what? Justin has to be on that liquor license personally. So anything that's considered a high risk business in some states, whether it's a shooting range, power, uh, power sailing, hang gliding, uh, skydiving, a bar, high risk businesses, when you get licensed for them, you can have the license under your corporation, but there has to be an individual responsible. So if there's any kind of negligence, that person goes down. And guess what? It works. I've owned a bar before. And when I know my ass is online, like in California, I could be at home sleeping. And if my bartender overserves someone and that person dies, I go to jail. All right. So it makes you run a very responsible business. Well, you know what? Imagine if all the, the, the people in the executive offices of the, these fraternities, were, their asses were on the line if something happened. Watch how quick they change things. So we should try to get legislation passed where there's individuals responsible. Um, so And watch how quick the nonsense stops. If, if all these fucking people that run these fraternities, like Wynn Smiley, who runs ATO, if all of a sudden if something happened in an ATO fraternity house and Wynn Smiley can personally go to jail for it, watch how quick everything stops in a day. They don't care right now because they're untouchable. None of them, the, the brothers get sued and the and the brothers' parents. So if your son's in a fraternity and and someone dies in that fraternity, you, your son doesn't get sued, you get sued. They go after your homeowner's insurance policy. The national has coverage and usually they just settle for the max that the insurance company would pay. And the national never ends up having to write a check at all, at all. The insurance company pays for their, their their defense, and then the settlement. And none of the people who work in the fraternity who are very well aware of what's happening ever are personally held liable. That has to change. We can't allow our kids to go in these situations. And, and the people who are in charge of them have no liability whatsoever, not even civilly. Forget criminally. And, you know, Gary Diversely case in 2007, it was one of the first times where they had three university administrators be charged, and then they dropped all charges. But like, that was a groundbreaking thing. And I think that had, needs to happen more right now. I think, um, especially if you can prove that the university was aware that this act, these type of activities are happening there and they continue to allow them to happen and results in someone's death, well, they should go down for manslaughter. And so yeah. that, that's why I continue to fight because I think we right now in our university system in a country, we have a ticking time bomb. Kids keep getting hurt. Kids are being mentally tortured and then some are dying. And no one's really doing a damn thing about it. The, the entire system is set up to, well, the reason it happens is because there's bad kids. No, how about it's bad assholes running these organizations? And they all know who they are. And I hope they're watching this. They have no business running a fraternity because they, they think they're, you know, in the movie Animal House, grown men that are living in the past, that have walk around with their fucking letters on their shirt. I don't walk around with a SIGEP shirt on. That was my that was my college years. I joined a fraternity to go to parties and get laid. Okay. And the brotherhood thing back then was real. So you know what? I, I do have some lifelong friends with it. But these people that live in that world their whole fucking life and are grown men and encourage these kids to kind of party the way they did when they know damn well kids aren't doing keg parties anymore. They're they're doing all sorts of drugs and they're drinking hard alcohol and you know. Fuck, lineups were bad enough in 1990. Lineups now are just flat out torture and like barbaric behavior. And the fact they allow that to happen and they're not being criminally prosecuted when someone dies, I don't get it. You know, someone made the decision at Delta Chi from what we're being told. I, I'd love to find out if this is true or not. If someone actually did tell those boys not to talk to the media and not go look for Riley, then that they should be hung from a tree. That is so Thank wrong. I'd love to find out if that's true or not, because if that's true, that's just unbelievable. That that really shows you where brotherhood is today in 2024. I think that 
you know, obviously, I don't know. We it'll be hard. It would be much harder to prove um, that they told them not to go search. But I think the actions speak loudly. It, the action, the silence screams that they were told to shut up. Because you have that many people, that many people that were here. Somebody was close to Riley. At least one person was close, and even they're not saying anything. Well, he was, know, I thought, he I thought, was Someone said his uh, girlfriend, he was only dating a girl for like 30 days. She stayed back and looked for him. But the fraternity brothers, some guys that knew him for years, they didn't stay back. Yeah. He was graduating. I, 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 I don't get it, you know. And uh, I, I just, you know, people like us, that, that was the saddest part of it. So that night when I did that one interview, I was so worked up because, you know, I, it, it felt very real. When we saw the Cajun Navy out on that island and they were all looking, you know, when you saw the cadaver dogs, you realized how serious this was. And I'm like, these are volunteers that, where'd they come up from? They were like in Alabama or so. Where'd they come from? New Orleans? Or Louisiana, I think. Louisiana, I think. Where the hell, like, I just, wow. I, I, I just would have thought like Delta Chi would have been all over organizing volunteers to come out. And I mean, what's the case you're looking at now? There's tons of volunteers out there. Looking, right? Seb Sebastian Rogers, but that's become a cluster in and of itself. And that's a different, but, but that's a different we, but yeah. But usually when someone's missing, everybody comes together, right? And so again, like, you know, I challenge like if 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 if, uh, <coughs> if Riley was on the soccer team or the chess club, the chess club would have been there looking for him. Hundred percent. And so this is what people need to, especially parents, they need to be aware of. You know, when their kid, when their son go, comes in and says, "I want to join a fraternity," even if they were in a fraternity back when they were in college, it's much different now. Uh, and, and, that, and that's what's really sad. And, you know, I, I, I found it very sad. Like, I'm not anti-fraternity at all. Uh, I've become it because I think the system is probably too broken to be fixed. And I'd love to be proven wrong. I would love it for, you know, these fraternities to get together and make it a safer environment and, and shut me up. But as long as they continue to operate it the way they are right now, I'm never going to shut up. You know, I'm working with multiple charities. I'm going to make fucking a few films a year every damn year just to torture them the rest of my life. Because I want the world to know what's going on it, it's such bullshit and um and they know it and they can't hide it anymore and that's the other crazy thing like usually like it's law 101 if um if there's a leaky faucet in a lobby of a hotel and there's proof we could prove that the general manager knew that that leaky faucet's been there for a long time and people keep slipping and falling and then someone slips and falls you're going to sue the hotel into the ice age for your broken back because they knew it was there and they didn't do anything about it why are we not suing fraternities into the ice age they know they have a problem with hazen and they just keep settling with people for like their policy maxes oh by the way the other funny thing to point out is more than half the fraternities are part of a group they own their own insurance company the irony of that to me is even crazy interesting because can you imagine getting pulled over by a cop and they're like license and your know, insurance registration. You whip this out and you're like, give it to them. The cops like, what's that? That's my insurance card. Like, wh what is this? I'd be like, that's Justin's insurance officer. I self insure. Self -insure. Like, Go fuck yourself. You can't self insure. Well, guess what? Most of the fraternities are part of a group and they self insure. They because no one would cover them anymore. They bought an insurance company, and they now that's have their insane. own policies. So right there, I, I, how could that even be legal? Like. A high risk business should not be allowed to self insure. So they set the policy limits. That's insane. When they're, getting, when they're getting sued, they're like, well, we only have a million dollars in our policy. That's it. It's like, says who? You? Like, my kid's dead. And it is them. It, it, it's utterly insane it is them. how that's even legal. And so there's so many layers to this from the way things work in Washington to the, the universities to how the nationals run things to you know this just the general attitude of, of of greek life at schools where it's like the prisoners running the prison um shit needs to change and you know i think the only hope now because I, I i crossed the line about a year ago where i'm not sure it could be fixed i think the only way to fix it is kind of what happened at disneyland a few years ago they had um a death on the matterhorn um they thought there was just a defective track they shut it down and um, they fixed it. They opened back up again. And guess what? Another car derailed in the same place. They couldn't figure it out. So you know what they did? They shut the ride down for a couple of years and they revamped the whole fucking thing. Maybe Greek life needs to be shut down for a couple of years and they need to revamp what it's all about. You know, I'll leave it at this. I had a, 
when I was at USC, I followed this thing called Abolish Greek Life Movement. There, Sigma Nu had like a bunch of sexual assaults all back to back in like a very short period of time. And the students were so appalled by this. Tens of thousands of them came out and they went on Greek Row and they marched. Right. And I remember talking to a lot of these kids and they weren't just upset at the fraternity. A lot of them were upset about a lost opportunity. There were a lot of great kids that were hoping to be part of Greek life there, but they're so mortified with what's happened and that they don't want to be part of it. So I remember talking to a fraternity president and I was talking to another guy named Judd Horace at the NIC. He said, Judd, here's the thing. Uh, you guys are the worst businessmen in the world because your entire business model is based on getting 30 to 40 new members a semester, right? And these are, you know, different people. I could argue with you that if you stop the bullshit, you stop torturing people, that you would get 100 new people a semester because there are far more kids that want to be part of this than not part of it. So if you're running a business, maybe stop the horse shit and, you know, maybe your business would flourish. You know, in the Adam Oaks case, Delta Chi was struggling to stay afloat at VCU. They needed members. Adam Oaks didn't have the minimum required GPA and another member, they, they didn't meet the GPA requirements. So Delta Chi decided to make them underground pledges where they initiated them anyway, which ultimately resulted in his death, but they were initiating them, making them members so they can get their dues, even though they wouldn't be official members. And then when he got his GPA up, maybe the next semester, they were gonna maybe lie and then, then try to make them official brothers. So because of their nefarious activity and because they're such assholes at DCU, they ended up, like, they had to bring him in as an underground pledge. Well, how about this? Just stop the nonsense. Stop torturing people, and maybe your membership will flourish. Because I I don't think Gen Zers today want, want to go through that. I don't know if they want to eat each other's shit or drink each other's piss and let a car battery get, you know, you know, uh, you know strapped to their nuts and get branded. I, I just honestly don't know, you know, who the hell wants to put up with that. And uh, for whatever reason, the, the guys in charge think that that's what kids want. They're really out of touch. And by the way, as long as they're never going to be held personally viable, it's all fun and games for them. They don't them. care. They don't care. And Gen Z doesn't give a shit. They will uh, you cancel. Know, you know, they don't give a shit. They won't do it. You know, it's interesting in a world today where it's very hard to hide secrets. It's shocking to me that kids can die and then no one even like no one even like puts anything out on social media. The fact that Cindy and Gary Hips don't know what happened to her son, Tucker. Now we're coming up on 10 years. The fact that Kim and TJ Birch, they're coming up on 10 years with Nolan. You know, they, they know the outcome. They have it on video of them, dry, you know, carrying his lifeless dead body. And it, it opens up my film. We show him dead. They're throwing him on the, the, so they know what happened, like, because they were there when he died. But we don't know what happened in the room off site. No one has ever told them exactly what he drank, what they did to him. And the fact that no one has ever come forward to the family and said, here's exactly what happened, because these families, to get closure, they just want to know what happened, All right? Like and, Natalie Holloway. Yeah. Beth, and, 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 and Karen you know, Bjorn Vandersloot. She just wanted to know the truth. Which has been 10 years now. She's been fighting her more now, right? It's been a long time. 50, she was missing so five, and she finally got it last year. Yeah, I know. So, it was, it was brutal. We killed her, killed her on the beach, and so which we kind of all knew. I mean, it was kind of obvious for a long time what happened. Um, but you know, these parents can't get any kind of closure and they can't really move on. And so, but imagine not knowing, but then the university where your kid died, the, the president won't even acknowledge you. The, the paternity is not doing shit to help you. It's just like, it's just a, across the board. It's just horrible. I mean, you're trying to get closure. You're still grieving. You can't even begin the healing process. Oh, and then the worst part is after you deal with burying your son, then you have to go through the civil process and the civil process is worth worse far worse than even dealing with the death of your son because the only way the fraternities can defend this shit is to somehow blame it on you that you're a bad parent while well, that's why your kid's dead. Not because they run a fucking gang and, and their members killed your son. Nope, it's your fault because your son had a beer when he was 16 in high school. Oh, and by the way, you don't go to church. No, by the way, you started birth, birth control when you were 16. What that has to even do with anything, but they mind fuck the parents. They, they torture them in depositions and they break them down so hard that every family ends up taking a settlement. No one goes to trial with these fraternities because the mothers are so distraught that they don't want to relive all that. And they just take settlements. And it's the same game over and over again. So no one has ever managed to really destroy these fraternities in court. And they take they take these settlements because they're so 
upset and they're like they're barely getting by. Like Linda and Adam Oaks right now. I mean, Linda and Eric Oaks, nicest people on the planet. Linda, some days can't get out of bed. She, they're going through the civil process now. It's horrible for them, and it's with Delta Chi. And watch what happens. I mean, it's not it's not over yet. But I mean, I, I gotta tell you, it's disgusting the way they even they even handle these these civil cases. Um, they need to accept yeah. responsibility, you know, and like, and instead they, 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 they have cruel ways of defending cases. Like I've never, some of the depositions of some of the families I've dealt with, you know, some of the questions that were asked to them, I'm like, what, what does that have to do with anything? But they, they try to flip it on the parents and, and, and that, you know, and it breaks them down. So it, it, it's, it's, it, when your son dies of a hazing incident, you are going to suffer for many years. And then if you're lucky, look at the piazzas. They're going on seven years and they don't even, the civil case is even done yet. They haven't even started the criminal part because they can't do the criminal. I'm sorry, the civil case hasn't started yet because they can't, they can't start civil till the criminal's done. So they've been grieving for many years and it's going to continue to go. And then if you're lucky, you know, maybe in two years, the piazzas can start to heal. Uh, it, it's just, it's like, it's a never ending nightmare. And, uh, and then when people won't even accept responsibility, I mean, not even a sorry or, you know, we fucked up, nothing. And the crazy you know, the, the nutty thing is most families I deal with don't have a mean bone in their body, don't want to harm any of these boys, um, don't really hold grudges, which really fascinates me on how they can be so forgiven when they haven't even asked for forgiveness yet. These kids are just, I don't know, you know, and so... That, so that's what I, so my job now is just to spread the word and hopefully my films keep making a difference and hopefully um, we start to fix this fucked up system because it's, I've never seen anything like this. And, uh, you know, it needs to go back to where it was. And if it can't go back, it needs to be shut down. And maybe, you know, the answer is we get rid of fraternity houses or the, maybe we start running fraternity houses like they do um, sorority houses where there's yeah. like, legitimate third party supervisors there i don't know you know something uh, responsible well i'll say that this was very enlightening to me i didn't know i mean even having been in a fraternity i didn't know a lot of this stuff and i think that it's it's obviously an issue because look at the end of the day it's all about keeping kids safe a lot of these kids you know they're leaving high school they're going into college they're trying to find themselves what they want to do who they want to be in the world like you said you are for guys, for most kids, I think you know your full your frontal lobe's not fully developed till you're 25. So yeah, you have good, you have what's probably not bad seeds. You have good kids making bad choices based on an archaic system that has always been, and from one generation, one pledge class to the next, just it just continues. Yeah. So uh, yeah, and and, so, and, and and you know and, and, and you know the good news is Gen Zers are a little more opinionated. So I challenge them to sit back and just all of a sudden to stop for a second and say, wait a minute. This is really stupid. Like, I mean, I thought some of the stuff I went through was dumb, but it was really at the end of the day harmless stuff, right? I some of the stuff they're doing now, I just I'm shocked that they A even do it, but B, they're not raising the alarm bells because how that's the other thing. We probably have a fractured brotherhood, right? Um, because if they're torturing I think each other, it proves it. Well, I think just how so close how close could you be? That's the other thing. So the two hundred brothers of Riley. Well, clearly, maybe, uh, maybe, maybe he went through tough shit. Like, they can't be that close because they would have stayed. So maybe did they haze each other? Or one like, could have stayed. Wow. One, one could have stayed. Not yeah. one out of two hundred. Yeah. So uh, it, that that was that was shocking to me. I honestly thought I was going to walk into like you know search teams. All these like they were going to be having another universe. Like the other thing is like Delta Chi National. Someone said they don't have a Delta Chi at, uh, at Vanderbilt. But if Delta Chi reached out to Pike and SIGAP and other fraternities, the Greek system, the Greek to Greek saying, hey, can you help us try to find our brother? You know the Vanderbilt Greeks would all gotten together to try to go find them. They also have a list of alumni that live in Nashville. Nashville's a big oh, city. I mean, I bet you there's hundreds of Delta Chi alumni in Nashville. I, I don't, I mean, again, like. If not more, yeah. You know, they can sit here and shit on me for being so hard, but you know what, you know, we, none of you were there. And so I just don't see how that's forgivable. I don't know how Riley's parents are even okay with that. Like she made a comment, the mother on how much the fraternity loved Riley. Well, I don't know. 
you know, Actions even speak louder than words, Dan. I yeah, the whole thing is weird to me. So I just you know, I um, you know, it's a sad story. Um, you know, it'll be interesting to see what happens as the autopsy plays out, and you know, they get tox toxicology back. But um, you know, the aftermath it was handled really weird. Even even the delay in calling the police that was a little the nine one one call doesn't it, it's a little weird, right? And uh, yeah, it is. I would be screaming frantically. If I was like 19 and my friend was missing, I'd be like, I would have been calling them like right away. I wouldn't yeah. be calling. Yeah. No. And then the other weird, like, you know, I again, I'm not a cell phone guy. I don't know if this is, you might know more of this than I do because you've covered so many true crime cases. But someone said the way the cell phone immediately went off with the last ping was suspicious because even if it went in the water, it would have gradually died. It would have stayed somehow would have like but the fact that he they said he had a he had a lot of charge on his phone and then the phone the way it was abruptly shut off was either the only way for that is either to smash the phone in the bits or take the sim card out so well, some of them have e and a lot of those cards have e-sims now like my phone doesn't have a physical sim card it has an e-sim so the only other thing that you i could think of if it wasn't it could have smashed to bits when he fell Maybe. that's possible because they're glass but at, or he could have already you know, he could have a cracked phone but wouldn't there be glass then down there where the credit cards were and stuff that we would have found the phone, right? Well, the, not necessarily, not necessarily, especially if the phone was in his pocket, which I'm guessing it, I don't know where the phone is. I don't think they found the phone. They found his watch. But like, if he had already, like how many times do you see people who walk around and the screen on their phone is already cracked? And if he already had a cracked phone, then that allows water to seep in and that could shut it down. Maybe. And that's, but that's all purely speculation. I mean, there's yeah. nothing to prove that he did or he didn't. Yeah. And so I, you know, I, I just, you know, you would have thought after they found his body, then they would have sent a dive team over to the area by where the credit card would see if the phone is right. Does, does anybody even went down there? To, I mean, that's shallow water. No. I mean, you can go down there tomorrow and go in the water see if, to see if there's a phone in there. Because that's you know, obviously where he went in the water. And that's also, that's the other weird thing. It, you know, Tucker Hips, they found him in water almost the same depth, and his body was there 12 hours later. It was just floating in the water. It wasn't even floating. It was just, like, stuck there. I... I even if he went in the water there, like they would have saw him the next morning. I don't know, you know, you know, remember, you don't, if you're on that, you look, look. look right there, you would have saw him right there. They didn't look. And he oh. was a big guy. He was six, seven. Yeah. And it, but, but then it did, but, but someone said it rained that night or night before. So that maybe the river was, was, I think was, so. was, uh, was more active. I don't know. But, you know, it's, I, I just, I'm kind of, shocked how quick everybody's just accepting what happened and i mean just whatever i'm not look the the cops may know what happened because there's a lot of damn cameras around there that we didn't see footage of true and they said there is more footage that shows more and whatever like you said parents and there was that one homeless guy that they want to question who took off the other day when they went to talk to him so who knows there could be something else going on but you know, my whole thing is I was there solely. You were there trying to find answers for the case. I was there analyzing how Delta Chi is acting in this whole situation. And um, to me, you know, that says it all about what brotherhood has become. I just felt like, you know, um, I, I just expected more. Um, that's all. I mean, you know, they can listen to, you know, I, I don't know, at 19 or 20, I would never listen to anybody of authority. If my friend was missing, I would have been hysterical in there trying to help find him. You know, yeah, you expect that out of a brotherhood, right? And uh, you know, if we could drink each other's piss, we should definitely look at look for each other if one of us <laughs> is missing, right? I mean, hundred percent, and nobody showed, nobody showed for him. So I, I just, you know, I saw that brotherhood fall apart, and other brothers took care. You know, when Adam Oaks died, he was on the floor, and they they forced him to chug a bottle of whiskey. And then he passed out and they partied over him. He was right on the floor, like right next to the kitchen. And if you watch Death of a Pledge, that's on YouTube, it opens up with the with the body cam footage and you see, we blurred it, but you see Adam's body right on the floor. So they were partying over him all night. No one did anything to get him help. They never checked his pulse. They never anything. So they're partying over a dead body. That that just shows what brotherhood's like. I mean, it's just like... and. And they know better. They go through hazing and prevention. They they see hear all these fucking stories, and it's still no, nope, they don't care. It's more about you know let's 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 have a good time. Don't want to get away a good time, you know. Which is crazy because I don't know about you. Did you kill anybody in college? I didn't. Nope. Did you have a good time? No, 
one. Not one. I had a great. I had a great time. I didn't kill anybody. I had a great time. So we should be fantastic kids time. That, look, you don't need to torture anybody or kill anybody to have a great time. So I don't know why they think they have to go to these extremes. And um, you know, so it is what it is. And uh, you know, so I'm not going to stop speaking out about it until shit changes. And uh, I want to help these parents. I'm going to give them a platform. Like you should have all the parents on when our film comes out. I can get you all the parents together. You Let's do it because. It, they're very real it's raw emotion and um you know maybe if a kid doesn't want to do it for themselves they'll maybe stop being stupid because they don't want that to happen to their parents like i would be mortified if my parents joined that club because i did something stupid and um yeah, you know, we could do that as a live stream we could do that as a live stream which would then get saved at the end so we could we yeah. can talk about that and arrange that yeah uh, for this episode we'll we'll wrap it up and i mean i appreciate you coming on and sharing this um it's an and we'll get it I mean, people need to really like pay attention to what's happening and, and really start looking into it. And now that I now that I told you about it, you're just gonna now, now you'll see it. You'll start seeing every day in the news more for like you know, the past like month we've had University of Maryland check Greek life down because pledges were getting tortured. We had UVA, SDSU is about to come public. They just they just expelled like they, they shut seven fraternities down, but they expelled like 150 kids and they they lit a pledge on fire. Another one, brand. Jesus. I mean, like this is like crazy shit going on. I don't know what is going on, <laughs> but like I mean, it's normal. That's sadistic. It's crazy, but it's become the norm, which is scary. And how people, you know. And by the way, university presidents that I've talked to, they don't want this, but they can't stand up to it. They'll lose their jobs and they'll lose their money, and they want help. That's what's crazy about it. I don't. I don't know one university president that is down with this. Well, maybe. Well, I don't know Jim Clement. So maybe, maybe you know the president won't talk to me at Clemson. But um, almost every other university president I spoke to is like, "Help! We don't know. We don't know what to do." Um, and so, you know, you're they're they're literally held hostage by these money people. Yeah. And so that's what's going on in our schools today. So. Uh, maybe your maybe your son or daughter becoming a plumber is probably a better option at this point. Holy moly! So, but we'll but we'll uh, but we'll get this out there, and I think that this has given me some ideas for some videos as well. And then, yeah. um, you know, once we launch it, this episode, I can share it with you, and you can share it with your followers if you'd like as well. And, yeah, and I'll give you, you know, and there's some clips from Protect the House that I can give you if you want to, you know, show some clips. It, you know, you yeah, we can that. I'm talking about these these parents. You know, it's pretty startling what's going on, and uh, yeah, and I, happy I, I, I can even send you videos, some hazing videos that kids sent us. You'll be like, "Are you freaking kidding me right now?" Like, I mean, yeah, we can do. We can blow the we can blow the cover right off of that. I'm fine with that. Let's yeah. do it. I'm here for it. Meanwhile, everybody should know Justin owns some badass Airbnbs in Pigeon Forge and in Gallagher. <laughs> <laughs> you you can rent the one in Pigeon Forge when it sleeps ten. I like you have the claw machine well, and everything. <laughs> That one, that one's in a great location too. I mean, phenomenal location. I mean, yeah. Feel free promote promote my Airbnbs as much as you want. Promote my books. That's totally fine too. Go, go for it because it's now becoming a full time gig. <laughs> hey, Kyler, we'll, we'll get Johnny Depp to go there for you. So they, they. Well, I mean, then I'm going to. But uh, <laughs> anyways, well, thank you so much for coming on, and yeah. uh, I definitely want to have you back for quiet on a discussion about quiet on the set. Yeah, you know we'll do it too. For you know, I, I, I'm gonna, you know, I'm gonna watch it this week. I'll, I'll, I'll text you email you, let you know my thoughts because I, I definitely need to see it. And that's a whole yeah. other good show. Again, very much like fraternities, Hollywood turned a blind eye and kept quiet about it for years because they don't want to fuck with these guys that were making all this money. You, know, they don't want to interfere in the money machine. They don't want to be the bad guy. That's exactly what happened in Hollywood. And that's what's happening in fraternities right now. Everybody's turning a blind eye. Well, before, before we go, I don't want to give a total spoiler alert on this, but I will tell you there, there was a dialogue coach named Brian Peck, and he's the one who basically raped Drake Bell, sexually assaulted him, and then after his prison sentence, Disney hired him as a sex offender. Well, out of Ada Badgley, who was a student advisor, uh, worked at Ryder University, who was originally charged with a crime in Gary Diversely Jr.'s death, uh, ended up getting fired by Ryder, and then she got hired by another university for the same job role. There you go. So, so I mean, it, it's like, <laughs> you know, you, you lost your job because a kid died. You were criminally charged, even although it was dropped, but you still, you were responsible and someone died. And then, 
someone puts you in the same job role somewhere else. In fact, almost every Greek advisor has been at a school. Actually, I don't know one major school that hasn't had hazing incidents. It's, you know, I, I, I got into it with the NIC like three weeks ago. They, they did these NIC awards and they, they gave some awards to a couple schools that have terrible track records with hazing. And I'm like, are we honoring them because they're doing a good job or because they donate, they, they contribute the most money to the NIC, which I think I know the answer to that. Uh, but it's probably latter. you know, it's you, you shouldn't be giving rewards out to Greek advisors at schools. If, there, if there's haze, I don't care if they're well-intentioned, you know, there's, that's like a participation trophy. Either you win or you don't. If, if they're, if you're to have a Greek life at a school and there's kids getting hazed, you shouldn't be, you shouldn't even have your fucking job, much, le much less an award. And so I just, it blows my mind. And so, but yeah, I'll, uh, let's definitely catch up again. Uh, you know, and, uh, you know, and, uh, you know, hopefully your viewers, you know, now look into all the stuff that's going on and, uh, you know, Google Tucker hips, Google Adam Oaks, Google Gary diversity, Google Nolan Burke, Google Jim, uh, Tim Piazza, Google Antonio Cialis, you know, Andrew coffee. Oh, we'll do videos on them. We'll do videos, shorter, shorter videos, so people can see those and at least get you know yeah. a text of what it is. Because I'm sure they don't know about it. No, that because because again, the, the schools don't have to publicize it, so they bury it. Yeah, that's why. I, All right, brother. I I appreciate it. Thank you for coming on, and um, yeah, we'll see you guys next time. Yeah. All right. Thank you so much, Justin.